Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Today we're going to talk about why receive the Holy Spirit. In Matthew 28 and verse number 20, it says, Teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Acts 1 and 4 and 5 says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. Acts 1 and 8 says, But ye shall receive power, after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you, and ye shall be witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and in Samaria, and unto the uttermost part of the earth. Acts chapter 2, 1 to 4 says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as of fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. So why receive the Holy Spirit? Why? Well, this is the church age, and this is a different age than the uh, Old Testament. So at no other time in the history of the world has mankind had this opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit. And thinking about Jesus, what did Jesus do to offer the Holy Spirit for us? He did it. The whole purpose that Jesus came into this life as a human being, God becoming a man, was for mankind to receive the Holy Spirit. This, obviously, is the gigantic reason alone. In fact, Jesus shed his blood through the beatings and then on the cross and died on it in order for mankind to receive the Holy Spirit. One looks at what happened immediately upon Jesus' death on the cross, and it shows us the intent of Jesus Christ with his death. In Matthew chapter 27, 50 to 53, it says, Jesus, when he cried, had cried again with a loud voice, yielded up the ghost. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. And the earth did quake, and the rocks rent. And the graves were opened, and many bodies of the saints which slept arose. And there came, and came out of the graves after his resurrection, and went into the holy city, and appeared unto many. Jesus' death caused an earthquake itself. <laughs> Another miracle was the fact that the symbol of the separation of mankind and God was shown to be spiritually torn in two. It wasn't just torn in two, but I mean it was from the top all the way to the bottom, completely torn in two. And that was not by a physical, not a, no one physically touched it. It was because of Jesus' death that that tore. So it was a miracle of God, God renting it from the top of the bottom for people to have the Spirit of God today. So that physical manifestation represented God's Spirit can now come into a human life. And that happened right in the temple. Amen. In Jerusalem. So it was not ripped just a little bit, but the whole veil was completely ripped in two from the top to the bottom, kind of like the body of Jesus that had been beaten from the top to the bottom, shedding his blood, no doubt, from every portion of his body to free mankind and offer 
mankind the opportunity to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Thus, mankind has the privilege and opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit that was in no other time period offered to mankind. No other time period in the history of mankind has this receiving the Holy Spirit been offered. And the only reason why it is offered is because Jesus Christ was brutally murdered, suffering the most humiliating and painful death experience that mankind could ever face. And those of his followers could do absolutely nothing to stop it. They couldn't do a thing. But it was all for the purpose of offering mankind the opportunity to receive the Holy Spirit. Amen. Therefore, what is the price of having one, only one person filled with the Holy Spirit? It was the death of Jesus. A brutal death. It is his blood shed, his own voluntarily will, dying for all of humanity. For the purpose of having mankind filled with the Spirit of God. It is of greater value than any physical house, any car, or any physical gift. It is more important, more necessary in regard to eternity than any other thing because it offers mankind salvation by the Spirit of God. In fact, John 3, 5 states, Jesus answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Thus Jesus Christ has made the reception of the Holy Spirit mandatory for mankind to enter into the kingdom of God. That is the kingdom of heaven. And the apostle Peter had named Jesus Christ as the judge of all mankind. If we read Acts chapter 10, 39 to 43, it says, And we are witnesses of all things which he did, both in the land of the Jews and in Jerusalem, whom they slew and hanged on a tree. Him God raised up the third day and showed him openly, not to all the people, but unto witnesses chosen before of God, even to us, who did eat and drink with him after he rose from the dead. And he commanded us to preach unto the people and to testify that it is he which was ordained of God to be the judge of quick and dead. To him give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. Thus, since Jesus is the judge and he has already proclaimed that reception of the Holy Spirit is necessary to enter into the kingdom of heaven, one must take it as the truth and nothing but the truth that the reception of the Holy Spirit is necessary and is not an option. In Matthew chapter 28 and verse number 20, Jesus has said to the disciples this, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. Amen. Here is the crucial point Jesus made. Jesus instructed his disciples to teach others across the world the same that Jesus had commanded them. That is the same commandments he gave to his disciples. His disciples were to command their followers likewise. Therefore, here one can observe the commandment that he had given to the disciples in regard to receiving the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, 45, it says, And being assembled together with them, commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem, but wait for the promise of the Father, 
which saith he, ye have heard of me. For John truly baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized with the Holy Ghost not many days hence. What is the commandment that Jesus commands his disciples here? The commandment was even in line or agreement with the Old Testament in celebrating the day of Pentecost. That is, the Jews were to go to Jerusalem and celebrate that festival. Yet, Jesus said nothing in his commandment in regard to celebrating the day of Pentecost. At least we have nothing written in the Bible about it. However, what Jesus does mention, though, to his disciples is to stay in Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father, which is the reception of the Holy Spirit. In these, in these verses, he clarifies to the disciples that they would be waiting for the promise of the Holy Spirit. And in order to receive the Holy Spirit, they would have to obey Jesus by sta staying in Jerusalem until they were to receive the Holy Spirit. The importance for today is not the location, but the importance for today is to be seeking the Holy Spirit as much as the disciples were told to wait for the Holy Spirit in Jerusalem. One can see that the disciples had also prayed for others to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. On the day of Pentecost, also the Holy Spirit the, the Apostle Peter had stated that the promise was not just for the Jew, but the promise was for all who are far off, as many as our Lord our God shall call. Therefore, it just means, quite frankly, that this experience was for everyone. Why would this be? First of all, if one takes into account that the disciples were commanded to preach and teach to their disciples and the believers to obey everything that the Lord Jesus had commanded them, it follows that everyone across the world is likewise commanded by Jesus and the apostles of the Lord Jesus Christ to receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit. The next verses, which that which the Holy Spirit is for, is indicated. It is to be a witness to all nations and how the first ones who received it and how they had received it. Let's go to Acts chapter 2 and 1 to 4. And it says, And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind. And it filled all the house where they were sitting, and there appeared unto them cloven tongues like as a fire, and it sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and began to speak with other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance. The disciples probably had no idea how they would receive the Holy Spirit, and possibly not even know when they would. They would not know all that God had in store for them, but God had prepared the reception of the Holy Spirit on the Jewish holiday of the day of Pentecost. Thus, while the 120 persons who obeyed Jesus waited for their experience of receiving the Holy Spirit in intense anticipation, the other Jews were on the outside of the room celebrating the day of Pentecost in a different way. They were continuing the tradition of the Old Testament, yet those who were obedient to Jesus Christ were there for the spiritual harvest and not the physical harvest. The rushing mighty wind came down into the room on the day of Pentecost. The rushing wind was the Spirit of God moving quickly, not slowly, to come down in power to the 120 people. The wind, it says, was also mighty. The adjective used that the wind was mighty meant that it was a powerful wind. But one could say that that is the most powerful wind on earth, for it came from heaven. 
Amen. And it was also the Spirit of God. It was not a, fit, a natural wind, but it was a supernatural wind. It was the wind of heaven come down from heaven because of the great sacrifice that Jesus had done for all of humanity. The wind came down for a purpose to enter into the 120 people. That is the first people that had received the Holy Spirit. The wind of God, the Holy Spirit. Thus it entered the believers just like what Jesus had said in John 7, 37 to 39. It states, in the last day, that great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, If any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture has said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the Spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given, because that Jesus was not yet glorified. This verse is referring to the reception of the Holy Spirit, explained in the Apostle John's own words in parentheses. Jesus had stated that the Holy Spirit is like having a flowing river flow out of one's belly. That river, obviously, is the river of the Holy Spirit. That is that which the disciples would receive it on the Holy Spirit, on the day of Pentecost. Amen. That stated, that stated by Jesus was in proverbial language from Jesus. And comparing this saying to what happened on the day of Pentecost and what had flowed out of the ones who had received the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, one gets the uh, true idea. That is, what had flowed out of the believers on the day of Pentecost was other tongues, as the Spirit gave them utterance, or a flowing river of words, speaking the wonderful works of God, adoring God. Thus, when one understands that the flowing of the spiritual rivers out of one's belly is actually one speaking in other tongues, that is what happened on the day of Pentecost. That is what is named in Acts 2 and 4 as the reception of the Holy Spirit. For it states in verse number 4, And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. The account here in Acts, for the first time anyone had received the Holy Spirit, not the gift of tongues, was filled with the Holy Spirit. When one speaks in tongues, giving, uh, when one receives the gift of tongues, that is actually a different gift. It is a gift given to the church body as a message. And I'll read it for you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 10 to 11, it says, To another, the working of miracles. To another, prophecy. To another, discerning of spirits. To another, diverse kinds of tongues. To another, the interpretation of tongues. But all these that work at that one and the self-same spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. So this actually in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, is talking about the gift of tongues to another diverse kinds of tongues. These spiritual gifts mentioned in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, that is not the infilling of the Holy Spirit, but they are gifts of God that is in addition to the blessings of being in the church body, the body of Christ. However, on the day of Pentecost, the gift is the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the gift of the Holy Spirit residing in one person's life. Thus, when one speaks in tongues upon receiving the Holy Spirit, one is actually filled with the Holy Spirit. And speaking in tongues for whoever was seeking the Holy Spirit is the evidence that they have received it, that is the Holy Spirit. 
Therefore, there are two reasons why someone speaks in tongues here. The one who is seeking the Holy Spirit begins speaking in tongues as a sign that one has received the Holy Spirit. The goal of the seeker was to seek for and receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Once a person who is seeking the Holy Spirit starts speaking in tongues, then that person is said to have received the Holy Spirit. How can we know this? We know this because in Acts chapter 2 and verse 4, what is said right after the statement that they all had received the Holy Spirit is the fact that they began speaking in other tongues as the Spirit gave them the utterance. Thus, one should note the big difference between 1 Corinthians 12, talking about the gift of tongues, and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is named such because it is actually the gift of God's Spirit to reside in mankind. And the one that is seeking that gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit, begins speaking in tongues when that Spirit comes in and resides into a person. And so he immediately begins to speak in other tongues. This understanding, the understanding is that the person was seeking for the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were not seeking for the gift of tongues. The gift of tongues is actually and only used when the congregation is worshiping together and it usually might happen after the preaching of the Word of God to confirm the Word of God. But that confirmation in the message is sent to the church body, the believers, for the purpose of edification. But the gift of tongues, the gift of tongues then, is actually a veiled message to the church body. The group of believers that have congregated together and it needs the next gifts operation which is the gift of interpretation of tongues in order to reveal to the church body what was said in other words it's the same message but just kind of like translated or interpreted for the church body so that they can understand it the reason that both the gift of tongues and the gift of interpretation of tongues need to be said one right after the other is because the gift of interpretation is of tongues is the same message that was given in tongues to the church body, but it is the revelation of what has been said. Hallelujah. So that the people are not in confusion. What what is going what is God really saying? They can understand what God is saying because then it is brought to them in their language. So that was actually a message to the church, either confirming the word or or it's some other, whatever God wants to do. When one receives the gift of the Holy Spirit and one begins speaking in other tongues, this is not really a message to the church per se, but in actuality, it is a sign to the unbeliever and even to the believers that one has been filled with the Holy Spirit, and it is of God. On the day of Pentecost, those who were gathered together in the upper room were there to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They were there for that purpose. They were not there to receive the gift of, the, of tongues. They probably never had never even heard, heard or what known anything about the gift of tongues, but they were seeking for the gift of the Holy Spirit. That's right. They were not gathered together to receive the gift of tongues. In fact, they probably, as I said, did not even know what the gift of tongues was until Paul, the apostle, began to explain it in you know, writing to the Corinthians, saying, hey, this is a gift. In addition, since Paul had not written 1 Corinthians yet at that time, you know, there were probably many people that didn't really understand what what God was doing, and he kind of named it, saying that is a gift, an extra gift, a gift of tongues, for 
the message of the church body and uh, obviously the gift of interpretation of tongues needs to be said as well to reveal the church what is being said by God to the church body. So that is kind of like the extra benefits, like, for example, the gift of prophecy. The gift of prophecy is a gift. It's not necessary to for everyone to have the gift of prophecy. Absolutely not. And as well, no one, not everyone needs to have the gift of interpretation of tongues or the gift of tongues referring to 1 Corinthians 12. But that is, that is not the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is necessary because it is for salvation. It is God's Spirit in us. And the tongues that flow out is just the evidence that God has resi begun residing in the person. So when one speaks in tongues as in the gift of tongues, one is actually giving a message. But it is a, a veiled message so that people can't understand it until someone begins to interpret it. That is the other gift, the gift of interpretation. Praise the Lord. And it's not the reception of the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. He's receiving a message and delivering that message to the church body, which is obviously different. Hallelujah. And that person who gives the message has already been received, has already received the Holy Spirit. So for the Corinthians who were adherents to Paul's gospel message, they had received other gifts of the Spirit. And Paul wanted to explain some of these gifts that were happening within the church body. So that we today could understand that hap that happens even today amongst us. And we do receive the gifts of the Spirit. After, of course, one has received the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. Thus, the name of one is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the name of the other is the gift of tongues. Or, the, or as it says, the gift. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Divers. Here it says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, to another diverse kinds of tongues. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So one is receiving a message when he receives uh, the gift of tongues and uh, he is delivering a message to the church body. Praise the Lord. The gift of the Spirit of God to reside in mankind is the gift of the Holy Spirit. The other is the gift of tongues, a gift that is used when the congregation is worshiping together and is used to confirm the Word of God or just give a, a message to the church body. It is also a veiled message that needs, it needs to be interpreted so that the congregation can receive the revelation of what is being said by the one who speaks in tongues or gives the message to the church body. So another that other gift, the gift of interpretation of tongues, needs to follow the gift of tongues or diverse kinds of tongues so that the church of body can receive that edification, can receive that message and be comforted. On the day of Pentecost, the receivers of the Holy Spirit knew not what they were speaking. They had no idea. They were revealed what they were speaking in a general sense by those who were on the outside, those Jews who understood what they were saying. But it was not something that was a supernatural gift of the gift of interpretation, it was their natural tongue that was being spoken and they understood what was said. Mm -hmm. Praise the Lord. Mm -hmm. So they were revealed what they were speaking in a general sense by those who were Jews there who had, who had other mother tongues mm -hmm. and the Galileans who were speaking in those other people's mother tongues mm -hmm. um, the tongues that they had spoken in the countries in which they resided, uh, you know, they could explain or say what exactly was being said. 
Praise the Lord. Thus, the ones who are actually understanding the message from the 120, who have just received the Holy Spirit, are the ones that have not yet from that point been baptized in the name of Jesus Christ and water baptism. And they had not yet either been baptized in the Holy Spirit. They were just hearing their own mother tongue being spoken and they understood what was being said. So it was a natural thing for them to understand what was being said. However, the gift of interpretation of tongues is a supernatural gift that the person himself doesn't understand the language that is being spoken, but the power of God comes upon the person so that he can reveal to the, to the congregation exactly what that other person has said. And if there is one person there who he may not have the Holy Spirit, but he speaks that other language that the person who, who spoke the, in the gift of tongues and he heard the interpretation thereof, hey, he's like, wow, they said the same thing, but one is in English and one is in my mother tongue that was spoken. So that God can do that. God can, can use that to convince a person, hey, this is actually of God. And then talk to the person later and say, hey, you were speaking in my mother tongue. And the guy says, I don't know what you're talking about because I don't speak that language. And that was of God. And it's a perfect, I mean, the, the, the message is spoken perfectly in that mother tongue. Praise the Lord. So the people that were on the outside of the upper room, they understood what they was what was being said. Different different people in different languages. And so, you know, they get all these kinds of and basically summed up was the wonderful works of God. And of course, you know, they were until that moment, they were unbelievers because they didn't they didn't believe in Jesus Christ. Peter had said that they were the ones who had crucified the Lord. They wanted Jesus to be crucified. But then later on, after Peter began preaching what had happened to these people, what had happened to them, and uh, what they had done to Jesus, some began to believe. And they were pricked in their heart, and, and they were convinced, and they decided to change and repent and receive baptism and the Holy Spirit as well. So... They were, at the time that they received the message, actually not in the church yet. But in part, that message that the uh, 120 were, were given was actually to them, to have them believe. And then the Apostle Peter began to speak out about Jesus. So there was no nothing no nest, there was no need for a supernatural gift of the interpretation of tongues to follow because the gift of tongues was not spoken. That was the gift of the Holy Spirit. That was actually God's spirit coming into them. It was not the gift of tongues. Hallelujah. The gift of the Holy Spirit was received. When the gift of the Holy Spirit is received, there is no supernatural gift of interpretation that follows it. It is actually just the Spirit of God coming into the person. Hallelujah. It's not, quote unquote, for a message for the church body. God may use it for to speak to another person that has that mother tongue that may not be a believer yet, like on the day of Pentecost. But the main purpose is just to give the Spirit of God to the person, whereas the gift of tongues, the main purpose is to give a message. Well, it's veiled first, and then the interpretation of tongues follows. Hallelujah. Whereas the gift of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues, that is the initial signal that one has received the Holy Spirit. When Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, 29 to 30, he says, Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles, have all the gifts of healing, do all speak in tongues, do all interpret, but covet earnestly the best gifts, and yet show I unto you a more excellent way. One should take note of what gift he is referring to in these particular verses. The reason why he states right after the words, do all speak in tongues, and says, do all interpret, he's referring to the gift of diverse kinds of tongues. 
Because right after that, he says, do all interpret. So he's talking about the gift of tongues, not talking about the gift of the Holy Spirit. The gift of the Holy Spirit is necessary. The gift of diverse kind of tongues or speaking, uh, the gift of tongues is not necessary. Hallelujah. So right after he says, do all speak in, with tongues, meaning do all in the congregation speak out in tongues to provide a veiled message do all interpret so he's talking about those two gifts that were one right after the other however he's not talking about the gift of the holy spirit that's not what he was saying hallelujah so in context he's talking about these gifts the gift of uh, work, the working of miracles and healings those are benefits it's not for salvation. And he says, covet earnestly the best gifts, the gift of prophecy. One doesn't have to have the gift of prophecy. That's not for salvation, but it is for edification of the church body. The gift of the Holy Spirit, on the other hand, is necessary. Hallelujah. Praise God. So the, the gift of tongues is a veiled message. And the gift of interpretation of tongues needs to follow it in order for the church body to be edified. And that is why Paul points that out. But also here he points out what he was referring to when he, when he follows with the words, you know, follows the words, do all speak with tongues with do all interpret. Meaning that he was referring to these two gifts working together. That is the, the gift of tongues or speaking in tongues with that gift of tongues. Not everyone has or does it because it's not necessary for salvation. It is a gift from God that is used for the church body to receive a message from God. It's much like the gift of prophecy in a sense. Not everyone has the gift of prophecy, a message from God to people. However, the gift of the Holy Spirit is a necessary gift because of the gift of God himself in a human life. And people receive that Spirit of God when they seek out for the Holy Spirit. So that is what Jesus was referring to in John chapter 3 and verse number 5. Whereas, except, it says, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So that in itself is for people to, hallelujah, get into the kingdom of God. But Paul was referring here in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 to the gift of tongues not the gift of the Holy Spirit. Praise the Lord. So not everyone has the gift of tongues, but everyone in the church needs, it's a necess necessity to have the gift of, of the Holy Spirit, needs the Spirit of God. Praise the Lord. So and then let's go to Acts chapter 8, and here we're going to find out something that is very special that happens to the Samaritans, they received the Holy Spirit too. And it says, Now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who, when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy, Holy Ghost. For as yet he was fallen upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. So here it means, you know, there's a difference between being baptized in Jesus' name and receiving the Holy Spirit. There are two different experiences. And one may not happen. It could happen, you know, upon uh, coming up out of the water, obviously. It could happen uh, at that moment that one is baptized in the name of Jesus. But here, for these people, for all the Samaritans, it did not happen that way. They were baptized in Jesus' name, but they had to wait for Peter and John to come down to pray for them that they would receive the Holy Spirit. Thus, we understand just from this that it's not something that nothing came out of the mouth. Something came out of their mouth. Some There was some kind of physical manifestation because they were saying, hey, they need the Holy Spirit. They need to come down and pray for them that they receive it. I mean, Philip could have said, well, just receive the Lord. And then they, they, they would say, okay, I received the Lord. But actually they said they had to pray for them to receive the Holy Spirit. Some kind of physical manifestation had to take place for them. So then in verse number 17, it says, Then laid their hands on them, and they received the Holy, Holy Ghost. And now here, listen to what this says. And when Simon saw that through laying on 
of the apostles' hands, the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me also this power, that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. The reception of the Holy Spirit happened with the people of the city of Samaria. All of the people had received the Holy Spirit. In other words, Peter and John began to pray for them, laying hands on them, and all of a sudden something happened in so much that Simon wanted to offer money because this gift is what he wanted. Their word says that they had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. There's something within these verses that give indication that the reception of the Holy Spirit was accompanied by something miraculously happening to the person who sought for the Holy Spirit. Simon was the observer. And he would not pay for the reception of the gift of healing. He had seen Philip preach Christ. He had seen Philip baptize these people. He had seen the healing take place. He had seen demons cast out. He had seen the working of miracles, but he didn't get out his pocketbook and say, I want to, you know, pay for this gift. I want you to give me this gift. He didn't do that. For the gifts of the Spirit, he didn't offer any money. However, he did offer money for people to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. What a difference that is. Simon, he knew the difference. <laughs> he wanted it the wrong way, but he knew the difference. Hallelujah. So he would not pay for the gift of miracles. And obviously, to have a gift of the working of miracles, that would be a, a wonderful gift. And, and to see healing take place, and to see demons cast out, that would be wonderful to see. But Simon wanted, instead, the gift, uh, in other words, pray for people like uh, the apostle Peter and John for them to receive the Holy Spirit. That That is really what he wanted. That He knew there was something different about that gift. And that was the one he wanted. So let's look at Acts chapter 8, 5 to 8. Here it says, Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits, crying with a loud voice, came out of many that were possessed with them, and many taken with palsies, and that were lame, were healed. And there was great joy in that city. When we read about the story of Philip here preaching to the city of Samaria, it points out that the things that the people in the city had problems with. And that Philip had preached to them that Jesus could heal them, and that Jesus could do many things for them in preaching the gospel to them. Thus, they were listening intently, and they were believers, actually, because God had done many. I mean, if they have a, a lot of people have a lot of belief, God can do many wonderful things there, and they obviously were believers. So the miracles and the healings took place. So in doing the, the doing the miracles, that must have been the working of miracles and and doing the healings that uh, must have been the gift of healing that was coming forth because Paul mentioned that about mentioned about that in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 7 11 he says but the manifestation of the spirit is given to every man to profit withal for to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, the, uh, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But all these worketh that one and the same, self same Spirit, dividing to every man severally as he will. Because there were healings that took place, and because the Bible specifically mentions in Acts 6, 8, 6, that the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. This means that Philip had a couple of gifts that are mentioned in 1 Corinthians. First, in 1 Corinthians, it mentions the gift of the working of miracles and the gifts of healing. Thus, in the city of Samaria, these are the gifts that God had used Philip for. For Simon and Simon was observer of these gifts, gifts that Philip had had used. 
had used, and that God used Philip IV, had used Philip IV. Yet at that point, Simon was not convinced enough that he wished or would like to pay for those gifts, even though they must have been phenomenal. He might have seen something similar to that, you know, with sorcery or something in the city. So he decided he's not going to pay for those. Thus, he did not take that keen interest in taking out his wallet and saying that he would like to pay for those gifts. However, the change takes place when the apostles Peter and John come down and the Holy Spirit is received by the people in the city of Samaria. When that gift was manifested, then Simon was interested in paying the apostles, Peter and John, to receive this gift. There needs to be some clarification here. First, the receivers of the gift of the Holy Spirit were the people of the city of Samaria. But Simon did not offer money to any of the people, but he only offered the money to the apostles, Peter and John. Further, Simon did not offer any money to Philip either for the miracles, healings, or the casting out of demon spirits. The real interest he had was for the laying out of one hand, one's hands and the people immediately receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. That said, it must have been that everyone that they had laid hands on had received the gift of the Holy Spirit and not just some but all of them must have received it. For his observance was in the fact that it interested him so much that he offered the money for that gift, the gift of the Holy Spirit. If it were the gift of tongues, they would have been together and it would have been a message to the people, but there was no waiting for the, a message. There was no interpretation, nothing like that. It was the gift of the Holy Spirit. And the difference here is the gift of the Holy Spirit, all received it and all needed it. The gift of tongues, obviously, was, hey, it could have been given by God to them after they received the Holy Spirit, but not all of them would have received it. <laughs> only, only some, amen. Praise the Lord. So, there was the laying of the hands of the apostles and every single one in the city of Samaria there that believed and had been baptized in Jesus' name had received the gift of the Holy Spirit immediately upon putting their hands upon them. That is what had impre so impressed Simon. Thus, we could say that there must have been a physical manifestation there. They must have spoken in tongues like the Bible says in Acts chapter 2. Hallelujah. So he was impressed with people speaking in other tongues. That is what really interested Simon. Had there been no outward manifestation, Simon would never have, have offered any money. For what reason? I mean, everything is, you know, silent. It's not, nothing's happening. But he offered it because there was a physical manifestation. There was, there were people speaking in other tongues. Simon did offer money for laying one's hands upon the people and for them to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. That is, they began to speak in other tongues. So that's what he was interested in. Therefore, what God had used the apostles Peter and John for were to pray for the people, the city of Samaria, and the people, one could say, instantaneously received baptism of the Holy Spirit. The fact that Simon had mentioned it is the fact that there had to have been some outward manifestation of the power of God in order for Simon to offer money to the apostles Peter and John. If there were no outward manifestation of any sort, then he would never have offered any money. What for? I mean, nothing's happening. Nevertheless, to him, it was more fascinating, more spectacular to have people receive the Holy Spirit than to receive their healing or miracles done. In Acts chapter 10, 44 to 48, it says, Well, Peter yet spake these words. We're talking about the time that Peter uh, goes to Cornelius' house now. The Holy Ghost fell on all them which heard the word. 
And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished. So here we're looking at another uh, group of people that are receiving the power of the Holy Ghost. And it says in verse number 45, And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. So they knew, hey, the Holy Ghost has been poured out. So there's something that triggered them to understand that this is the Holy Ghost. And what is that which they understood it to be? Verse 46, it says, For they heard them speak with tongues. So that indication to the Jews at that time, they knew it was the Holy Ghost that had come into them because they spoke in tongues and magnified God. Then answered Peter, can any man forbid water that these should not be baptized, which had received the Holy Ghost as well as we? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. Then prayed they him to tarry certain days. Here the apostle Peter was invited to come and preach to some Gentiles in their home. God had given him a vision, and Cornelius had been visited by an angel. Therefore, the result was this fact. Peter entered the home and preached to them about Jesus Christ, what he had done, and the fact that he was the judge of all humanity. Then the Jews that were with Peter and Peter himself had been eyewitnesses to the Gentiles receiving the Holy Spirit. Thus, the Gentiles received that power of the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues. The only way that the Jews knew that, knew that, or how the Jews knew, that was the fact that they had heard them speak in tongues and magnify God. Speak with tongues. Amen. So verse number eight points out that they had heard, verse number 48 points out that they had heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. Thus, these Jews had understand that the Gentiles had also received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Amen. In Acts chapter 19, 1 to 6, another group of people, these are the disciples of John. It states, And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. And all the men were about twelve. In verse number six, it clarifies for the reader whom Luke wished and God wished that the real church know that the ones who had been baptized in Jesus' name, had received the gift of the Holy Spirit. This The same happened when Peter and John had laid their hands on the people of the city of Samaria. The Holy Ghost came on them, and they spoke in tongues. Paul here lays his hands upon the twelve disciples of John the Baptist. They received the Holy Spirit, and they spoke in tongues too. Same thing. And so, obviously... The Spirit of God came in them. They spoke in tongues as the Spirit of God gave them an utterance. Hallelujah. In John chapter 3, in verse number 8, the Bible says, The wind bloweth where it listeth, and thou hearest the sound thereof, but canst not tell whence it cometh and whither it goeth. So is everyone that is born of the Spirit. Jesus was the one here with the Pharisee Nicodemus, explaining to him that everyone that is born of the Spirit has a sound coming from them. The sound is heard from the speakers as on the day of Pentecost. As to the Gentiles, and here to the disciples of John the Baptist in Acts chapter 19. They had all spoken in tongues, and even in Acts 8, the Samaritans, one could say, had also spoken in tongues as God gave them the utterance. For Simon was the one who testified it, though his purpose was not right in the sight of the Lord. He still had reason to offer the apostles, Peter and John, money in Acts chapter 2, verse number 33, it says, Therefore, being by the right hand of God exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed forth this which ye now see and hear. The Holy Ghost is something that you can see and you can hear it. So this is the confirmation by the Apostle Peter that the Holy Spirit's reception is something which you can see and hear. As Jesus had said to Nicodemus too, that everyone that is born of the Spirit has a sound coming from them.
In Acts chapter 5, in verse number 32, it says, And we are his witnesses of these things, and so also is also the Holy Ghost, whom God hath given to them that obey him. The witnesses of Jesus Christ are those that also witness this, that the Holy Spirit is given to those that obey Jesus Christ. It happened on the day of Pentecost. Those who were obedient to Jesus Christ had received the Holy Spirit because they had waited in Jerusalem to receive the Holy Spirit. And finally, in Acts chapter 2, 38, 38 to 39, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Hallelujah. Thus the people of God have, prom have a promise to receive the Holy Spirit. And it is to everyone. It says, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. So everyone can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. They can all have the gift of the Holy Spirit speak in tongues. Hallelujah. Because it's God's Spirit coming into them. Amen.